heart there it is that's when you're you're justified so, by faith so my know. question can you go to acts twenty two sixteen? here's my question that i would humbly love for you to answer so we talked about this for you know two hours and 45 minutes before and now we've been going for almost two hours so acts twenty two sixteen, ananias says why are you waiting arise and then he tells them be baptized and wash away your sins Baptized and wash away sins are imperative commands. That means it's the mood of, it's a command, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, and I stated when you, how do you call in the name of the Lord? By being baptized and in doing so, you're washing away your sins. And you stated multiple times that calling on the name of the Lord is not connected to baptism. It's only connected to wash away sins. And you've made, you've even used the language, right? Uh, you've used the Greek language and said, the participle only modifies wash away sins. It's connected would, to there. And in the last episode, you agreed that it's it's connected to calling on the name is what's no, wash away sins connected to them. You didn't? I, did you watch, watch I did not agree with you. I agreed that calling on the name of the Lord is connected to wash away sins, but I also said it's connected to baptize. I think, and I have evidence to prove it's connected to both of them. And you said it's only connected to one. So I want to know why you think calling on the name of the Lord is not connected to baptism and only connected to wash away sins. Like, are you relying on, I, I'm not a Greek scholar. Do you think, I mean, I would, I wouldn't think you think you're not, a Greek scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar, but uh, I'm sure you know, I can get a hold of James White really quick, who is probably the best Greek scholar on earth. Uh, well, so, so let me ask this. So do you think calling on the name of the Lord is only connected to wash away sins and not uh, baptism? Yeah, I believe, I believe it's uh, connected to calling on his name, uh, rise and be baptized. Okay, that's one phrase, right? Hey, no, not one on. phrase. It's they're different words. They're different. They're tenses. different words. Rise and be baptized. Okay, they're different. They're different tenses. So, all right. So, okay. Look, let's look. We can look at the tenses here. I'm not scared to look at tenses. Can I answer? Verb, your aristus, aristus, active participle, singular. Okay, be baptized. Yeah. Aris, middle imperative. Verb. Uh, verb. Yeah. Okay. So rise. Verb, and be baptized so do you, right? do you have an do you have an answer no i think this is what christians do what, what believers do look That's and look and what wash away your sins calling on his name so here's my question like it goes back to this again you're saying what ananias is saying is rise and be baptized and wash away your sins be baptized like no. this is what you have to do you have to get around it like instead of like okay what does that mean where like here's paul paul literally literally tells us right here what he yep. what he understood let's just like instead i don't care what you understand i want to care what does god's word say and what does paul understand how does he say it well he says the words near you in your mouth and your heart the word of faith which we preach that if you confess with your mouth that's what calling on the name of the lord is we just looked at the word in greek what it means if you confess with your mouth jesus lord believe in your heart god raised him from the dead you will be saved then for whoever calls the name like he's quoting again whoever Call his name of the Lord be saved, right? And let, let so me get right here. Wait, wait. Like, let me explain again. How then not, will they call? You're not, you're not believe, the question, obey the gospel, you. believe, hear, heard from us. <clears throat> Go ahead. All right. So I asked the question why do you think calling on the name of the Lord does not apply to baptism and washing away sins, both imperative verbs? I don't think I'm going to get an answer. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you what I think is the proof. So the two middle imperative verbs are bound by chi and and who are you, the who are you reading right now so I can look it look it up I probably got it are I mean, you reading you can, something you can pull the Greek up and look that the word and is chi I don't need mm -hmm. to read that I think it's there no I'm just I, I thought you were reading something there look like you're reading I'm about to give you some Greek resources that you can look up if you want so uh, this is um, let's see I got a list of okay anybody watching I got at least twenty I'm not going to read all twenty of them these are Greek resources they're Greek scholars who are not members of the Church of Christ, that say that the language 
tells you that calling on the name of the Lord is connected to both baptism and washing away sins. H.B. Hackett, who's a Baptist scholar, he says, wash away your sins states the result of baptism in language derived from the nature of that ordinance. It answers or corresponds to the same phrase for the forgiveness of sins in Acts 2.38. George Raymond Beasley Murray, a Baptist, said, he in baptism calls on the name of the Lord. Okay, uh, Expositors, Greek New Testament. These are not members of the church. They're just guys following the Greek grammar. They say this, what well, wash away is middle. And he gives us a reference, Acts 2.38, the result of submission to baptism. So he says, apeluse, which is wash away, that is result of baptism. The Tyndale Commentary Series, Ananias' somewhat reproachful question, why do you wait, is slightly odd. The Greek phrase may mean, what are you doing? Paul is to get up, act straightway, and submit to baptism. Let me As just pause in, you real quick and tell you, like, I agree with that. Here's what, no, oh, there, no, there. no, listen. Here's you what, don't like, I'm coming from, <laughs> listen, I'm, I'm looking, look, I'm, I'm behind the curtain. Look, I've been behind the curtain, Aaron, right? I've been a church of Christer. I preach in the church of Christ. Taught, I taught this stuff. I'm coming well, from the angle. I'm coming from over here. Like I'm coming from behind the curtain. Like you're trying to prove the point that you're, you're trying to say that when you're baptized is when your sins are washed away. Now is, can I go and say like, so when I'm talking to you, okay, a church of Christer, I'm trying to explain to you a deeper understanding of calling on his name does not mean be baptized. That does not mean be baptized. So when we get baptized, okay, we are saved when we have faith in Jesus Christ, okay? That makes us a member of the Lord's church, the invisible global universal church, okay? Then when I get baptized into Christ, right, that is a picture, it's a symbol, just like if we go back to Romans 4 and 5 and those things right there, 3, 4, and 5, we go there, it's a symbol of just like circumcision was, like you said earlier, circumcision, Old Testament, baptism, New Testament. I totally agree. But see, that no. circumcision didn't really do anything, and neither this, does baptism. It's an outward showing of what is the covenant promises of God. So you're now calling, you say, call your name. We can go to First Peter 3, 21. No, we don't have to. Do so all I'm saying is I like you. you. So I'll say this. I, I really do enjoy our conversations, but you try to put words in my mouth quite a bit. And that's why I say, no, 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 I don't agree with you. So what I'm saying is Acts 22, 16, you have asserted over both conversations that calling on the name of the Lord is not connected to baptism. It's only connected to wash away sins. And I am showing you why do I think it's connected to both? Because Greek scholars, not Aaron, Greek scholars who Calvinist, this is a Lang is a German Calvinist, a German Protestant style. Tyndale Commentary, Expositors, Greek New Testament. Well, you're not understanding them, Aaron, because I promise you no Calvinist believes you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, you might you might just be surprised. Some Calvinists follow the language, and then they say they don't agree with it. Listen to A.T. Robertson. Do you think A.T. Robertson I don't know who A.T. Robertson is. Let me see if I got him in my library here. Robert, uh, A.T. Robertson is one of the most famous Baptist Greek scholars of all time. And it, this is what he says about Acts 22.16. He says, be baptized. If you have, I got, where is it? I've got, this is um, Word Pictures New Testament. This is A.T. Robertson. This is what he says about Acts 22, 16. He says, be baptized is a first heiress middle causative. It's not passive. He's saying, get yourself baptized. Submit yourself to baptism so as to get washed off. It, and then listen to what he says. In Acts 2, 38, it's possible to take these words as teaching salvation by means of baptism. So he says, the, the, the grammatical in Greek, it can connect the two. And then he says, but in my opinion, that's not what overall, overall Paul's doctrine is teaching. So what I'm saying is I am just pointing to scholars who are not members of the church, who are just Greek scholars. And they say, this is what the Greek says. And they say that they never once say that the participle phrase can never be connected to both verbs. They say, in fact, a lot of them say it is connected to both verbs. Well, no, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'll say it's not never, but like you just said, a lot of them do say, but a lot of them, a lot of Greek scholars say that this wash away your sins is connected to calling on his name. Is that fair? You, is that fair? No, you're, 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 no, okay. It's not fair. So you when, have, you, when you said a lot of Greek scholars do say it's both, you're saying what you really mean is all scholars say it's both. Is that what no, you're saying? What I, you ask questions and then don't let me answer. So you ask, is this what you're saying? And then you interrupt me and don't let me answer. So what I'm saying is, I think that you've been asserting something for the last two conversations, which you can't back up. Now, maybe you can go find something later, but all I'm saying is, I don't think it's wise that you assert that the Greek, that calling on the name of the Lord 
is only connected to wash away sins unless you have evidence to back it up. And right now, unless you've got some, now you might be to go find some, but I'm saying, some. but what I'm saying is you should, you shouldn't assert something without doing the research first. So you shouldn't assert calling on the name of the Lord is not connected to baptism because it doesn't fit theology. Exegetically, you should be looking at what the text says and not, well, this can't be saying that because it ruins my theology. Well, maybe the theology is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so Acts 22, 16, that's, that's the question. I think that those so watching. You, okay. Let me just ask you. So you, you've been doing I, Acts 22, 16 for a lot. Go ahead. I go ahead. Finish. finish and then I want to, I want to ask something. So obviously those watching can determine for themselves. Um, I'm happy to provide these resources if somebody wants uh, wants them. Um, I would recommend uh, a book, Baptism in the Greek by Dave Miller, for anybody who actually wants to see what the Greek in common language says. I've never claimed to be a Greek scholar. I just read Greek scholars and say, these guys said this. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is to make the assertion that there's no way calling on the name of the Lord modifies baptism and wash away sins is not true. And there's lots of guys who are Baptist um, Presbyterian, <laughs> all, all denominations you want to find that would say the exact same thing. We're, okay, that's that's fine, Aaron. But like, but ev no Baptist would agree with you that you have to be baptized to be saved. That's the point you're making. That's the point I'm arguing. There's that's a, a Presbyterian with AT Roberts. Okay, okay. I know. I know. Look, look, you, Travis, Johnny Robertson, all the all the Church of Christ people like to quote this AT Robertson and say what a great scholar. I, I, whatever, maybe he is. I don't know, but I know y'all all like to quote him. Let me ask you something now. Let me let so me go I, somewhere. I, I would say this. Number one, uh, I appreciate the arguments that I make, not the ones others make. So I wouldn't put me in the boat with anybody else um, and try to act like the arguments that they've made are ones I've made. I'm just saying they use the same guy. That's fine. And the only reason I use him is because he is a Baptist, world-renowned, recognized scholar. And he does not, he even says he doesn't agree with the theology. But he even in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 says the same thing. He said, one will determine what this means based off their theology. So I'm saying well, I don't care what he says. Like I, okay. just like you don't care, I don't care either. Like okay, fine. So so we've talked about calling on the name Lord. Are you ready to go to Acts two? Wait, you want to go to now, Acts now, two? Now wait a second, real quick. We we did your sure. Acts twenty two sixteen for a while. Sure. I really want to. I'm going to hold you to something now. Okay. Have at it. Okay. Does the word of God contradict? Do you think I'm going to say no? Well, of course <laughs> you have to say no. Yeah. <laughs> Again, so let's just, I want to camp out here for a little bit. You agree that Paul is praying? Right. Do you no, want to just, talk about really, again? I thought we wrapped up Acts 22 with the bow. Well, no, I mean, here's my thing. You you want to go, we're, we've been in Acts 22, 16, talking like this, just like, what do you do with, what do you do with this? Really, what do you do with this? I explain. Jesus I, is I, hearing I, his prayers and answering his prayers. Just, I want to hear it, and then we'll go to Acts 2.38. You want to see me explain it? About him praying, about Jesus hearing his prayers and heeding his prayers and, and speaking back okay. to speaking okay. back to Paul, speaking so back to him one, and giving him a vision, answering his prayers. I'll answer it quickly. Number one, the text nowhere says God answers his prayer. He's likely praying for what? Forgiveness. You keep asserting that God heard it. I agree with you. Keep asserting God heeded it. I disagree with that completely. Acts chapter seventeen and verse twenty-seven says that God is what not far from anyone seeking him. Uh, Matthew chapter seven and verse seven says, ask, seek, and knock, ask, it will be given to you, seek, and you'll find knock and it will be open for you. God moves providentially. So just because Paul's praying and God comes to him does not mean that God somehow was answering his prayer in the sense that you're trying to say, as far as heeding goes, uh, in Acts chapter eight and verse 28, you have the Ethiopian eunuch who's coming back from Jerusalem. God sees him reading scripture. God sees him. He's a lost person but he is seeking God. And so what does he do? He sends a preacher to him. And whenever Philip gets there, it says he preached Christ, Acts 8.35, right? If you want to go there, Acts 8.35, he preached Christ. Do you disagree or agree he preached Christ in verse 35? No, I agree. But here's what I would say to you. You're, you're right that he was seeking God. But the question is, but no one seeks God. So the question is, why did the Ethiopian unit seek God? Why did I seek God? If no one on their own, in, in their own being, doesn't seek God, then how do I make sense of this apparent contradiction? I sought God. The Ethiopian eunuch sought not, God. 
So there's not a there's not a contradiction. You're jumping context, and that's why you're going to Romans three. I'm just saying, man. There's definitely not a contradiction. But what you want to okay. say is so. Okay. I answered. I answered it. So God's people who are seeking for God, God wants to be saved. Obviously, Paul already had some sort of thing in his mind because God says, "Why are you kicking against the goads? Right? Why why are you fighting against this? Mm -hmm. Do you know exactly what was going on with Paul? I don't, but I know that Acts twenty two sixteen. Ananias is inspired. He's working miracles. I mean, the only way is to say that Ananias was not inspired or else verse 16 is right. And verse 16 is right. Yeah, let me let me tell you when you said Paul was seeking God, right? But see, the Bible says that no one seeks God in their in their right. flesh. And I can tell you, wait, I want to answer this. No one seeks God. No one. That would include Paul, you and me. You, so why? Wait, let me just look, look we got time. Don't ask, let me, why don't was ask Paul seeking? Don't ask me a question if you're not going to let me answer. Like, if you want an answer to a question, then ask me a question. If you just want to make a statement, make a statement. Like mm -hmm. Romans 3, if you want to make a statement, make one. I'm all I'm down for that. But if you want to ask me a question, you got to let me answer. That's only fair. Okay, can I? Yeah. Okay. So no one seeks God, according to the Bible. But you said Paul sought God. He did. Ethiopian <laughs> eunuch did. But why? Here, here's why Paul did, because when he who had set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Again, that's that's what he's appointed to do. See, this is why he sought God, because God sought him first. Nowhere in Scripture does someone seek God on their own. God always speaks to man first. So this is the, the deal right here. So, yeah, no one seeks after God. That's true. See, the Bible's true, and it doesn't contradict anywhere. But here's why he did that. This is why right. he was seeking after God, because God sought after him, and God appeared to him. And when God opens your heart and my, when he opened my heart and my eyes to his word, and the word became flesh, boom, changed my world. But go ahead. Do you want to go to Acts 2 now, or you want to say something here? I'm fine to go to Acts 2, but I would say this. I, um, I don't know if you don't know this, or maybe you do know it, and I, don't, I hope it's not a tactic. Uh, you know that while Romans 3.12 says none who seeks after God. Other passages like Job 8, 5, Psalm 62, uh, 2 Chronicles 30, 19, talks about people who seek God. So there are different passages in different contexts. And to just isolate one is a little, um, I, I would not say is very, uh, I wouldn't say that I, anybody watching, I would not want to isolate a passage. Um, for instance, like Acts 22, 16. If you, I don't know how anyone could less Proof text, Acts 22, 16. We covered the entire account. Proof so, text. Yes, there are people who seek after God, right? You Okay, you just said it. Well, you stop. just said it. Hear me out. But, but this right here is true, right? No one seeks it, after God. So the question is, why do some people seek after God? Verse so you, 12. we got to go deeper. Are any, are there, okay. I, I know it's your podcast, so I know that you get to talk to them. I'm just trying to say. No, go ahead. I mean, say what you want. Verse uh, Romans three twelve. There is none who does good. Is mm -hmm. that true? Yeah, there's no one who does good. No, not even one. I would say, okay. and that would include everyone. So before you, you come to Christ, before you before you're regenerated, before you, you can do nothing good outside of faith. Apart from faith, everything's sin. Isn't so that what Romans says? We well, what Romans says in one statement. I'm going to disagree with you. Well, so do this. I'm fine to talk about total depravity. That's crazy. If, Go ahead. No, it's not. I agree with that. But what I'm saying is, you know, for those watching, you're making a statement like, hey, the Bible says no one does good. Well, I can show you passages in the Bible where someone did good. And what you're saying is, oh, no, no, no. The, no, no, the Aaron, question is why? How do, how do people do anything good? How, do they, how does a, anybody do good? That's a different conversation for total depravity. In fact, why don't we go to Acts chapter 2 that's and wrap up today? So I let's go to that. Acts 2. So, um, and then I have a question for you, just a, a simple, simple question. All right, Acts 2. So in Acts chapter 2, um, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, mm -hmm. right? And they ask Peter in verse 37, what must we do? In our previous conversation, I'm assuming, I'm trying to save time. I'm assuming you have the same belief as in our previous conversations where you had said that as soon as their hearts were pricked, they were already saved. And that when Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, Mm -hmm. that you are trying to say that that means repent and be baptized because your sins are forgiven already. Is that still the position? Yeah. 
because of what Christ did at the cross. Okay. So you say that they're saved when their hearts are pricked. Yeah. When they believe in Christ and they put their okay. faith in him, they were so, cut to the heart. Like Lydia was okay. cut to the heart, right? When she heard the gospel, so the, Lord actually, opened, the Lord opened her heart. Yeah. She was worshiping before the Lord opened her heart. She was a worshiper of God. Yeah. But then the gospel came just like Cornelius. He was a worshiper of God. And then so, the gospel comes to him. So Lydia was totally depraved, worshiping God. Okay. Um, let's go to Acts 2.37. So Acts 2.37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. So they're believers. We agree they're believers. And you say they're saved. And they ask Peter, what shall we do? Mm -hmm. And Peter doesn't say, well, you believe you're saved already. He doesn't say, well, you've already called on the name of the Lord in belief. Mm -hmm. He says, repent, which is a command. And let every, every one of you be baptized, which is also a command in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, can you explain to me why now, you what, think... Which one are you reading here? That's Acts 2.38. Uh, what, what translation are you reading? You pick one. <laughs> no, you, you you tell me. All right, that was New King James, but you like yeah, the ESV. So, well, and I mean, like you, you, you're jumping around to make your points because if you want to... You remember earlier you were saying, like, go to New King James because it says this and go to this one because it says that. But baptized here is singular. It's not, it's not a plural... It's a singular in the Greek. All right. Now, before you make that argument, because I know where you're going, let's clarify. Just are, you, you. are you making the argument that, explain to me what Acts 2.38 means from your perspective. Is it because sins have been forgiven, or are you going to make the different in person number argument? No, uh, I'm saying it's because their sins are forgiven. Okay. Because for here. So, so this... Because so, of what Christ did at the cross. So they are saved before repentance. Are they, you Repentance. just said, listen, again, again, faith in Christ produces confession, repentance, baptism, feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, doing good works, faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ produces good works. But you're saved before you repent, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, in verse three. yeah faith, you're justified by faith according to God's word. Okay. Justified so as if you never sin, justified by faith. So, so you believe that as soon as you believe, you're saved even before you repent? Uh, I would say just like, I know you don't believe the book of John, but John 3.16, <laughs> well, no, I mean, you can't, and I'll hold you to the fire on that. But John 3.16, well, I, well, I can't wait to get into that. But John 3.16, you know, everybody knows that verse. You don't even believe that. That doesn't apply to us today, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But I guess believe means baptism, you know, but yeah, so that's I'm, exactly. So if I believe... If I truly believe and trust in Christ, I'm okay. going to repent. I'm going to confess. I'm going to live. I'm going to leverage everything I have to the advancement of the King Jesus's kingdom. Okay. That's what faith produces. But you still think, but you're still saying that you're saved before you repent. So a person. How, how, how many times can I answer that? So, well, I mean, so, so your answer is yes, you're saved before you repent. You're saved when you put your faith in Jesus and that happens okay. first. Before repentance. Then it produces yeah. repentance. It produces baptism. It produces confession. So faith produces good works. Like Abraham, by faith, what did he do? He went did out he, to land called he, Genesis. He did that. What did Noah do? He built an ark. Why? Because he had faith. He truly believed. Yeah, obedient faith. Mm -hmm. uh, so you think that Acts 2.38 says, repent and be baptized because you're already saved. So... Can you explain to me why you think the word for, the Greek preposition, means because of? Yeah, I, right here. Uh, multiple times in the Bible it's used that way. For, uh, because of, like when John the Baptist was beheaded, why was he beheaded? For his faithfulness. That's what it says, ice, because of his faithfulness, right? So him being beheaded didn't make him faithful. What passage is that? Oh, let me see if I can find it. See if it's in this note. Uh, so here's some examples. Uh, Trees on the Greek preposition says that ice with the accusative is used also to note the object with regard to which anything is done, thus signifying in regard to, with reference to, of course, in con the context or the general scope of scripture teaching must determine whether this reference be to the future with italic sense and right here, right, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch, um, in order to, right, in order to catch the fish, right, 
Uh, and right here, here's where, when I came to Trous to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open, I mean, just read it. With but reference to, uh, so Luke, with reference to. Luke 5, 4, I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. What? Luke, Luke 5, 4, right? That's the one you have in your note. So when he put out, speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets. Because you already catch. Had, but that, but that no, doesn't so make he, sense. No, so he will catch. That's what it's saying. Okay. Like it depends on the context. It could mean because of or in reference to, but like right here, he's putting out his net. Why? To get the fish. So I'm, I'm gonna, agreeing with you. This would be the way you would see it, right? Well, Luke 5, four, yeah, I, I'd this say this. This is the way you would I'd see say, it, right? I'm not a Greek scholar. And so what I would say is We know you keep saying that. Well, good. I want I want people to make sure they know I'm not claiming to be one. Um ace is a preposition that occurs 1774 times in the new testament and if you look up greek lexicons it's always forward pointing there was one guy in the 20s no, there's not always forward pointing i, I man I i'm just saying a jr manti i i wrote a 30 page paper on this for uh grad school if anybody wants me to send you this paper email me at gallagher at gbntv.org mm -hmm. or find me on facebook i'll send you a 30 page paper where um, basically this is called the causal use of ACE. And it's the idea that because you can, you know, like John MacArthur, he says this, he says, because of your sins make sense. And they say, well, does a person get sent to prison for murder because they murdered or in order to obtain murder? And number one, this is, that's a really bad because you're arguing from English. Um, I've got a hermeneutics book that Moises Silva wrote. And he said, you can't assume linguistic rules of English uh, correspond to New Testament Greek. Um, Daniel B. Wallace, who Dallas Theological Seminary, I don't think anybody that knows anything is going to argue he's not a scholar. He basically wrote a book in 96, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, and he discusses the use of ace. And he said, and the causal use, because is nowhere in that book. He even talks about the discussion. And if you want to read the history of it, I'll send you my paper or anyone that wants to read. In the 1920s, there was a guy named J.R. Manti who all of a sudden came up with this new use of ACE that nobody before him for 1800 years had brought up. And this guy, J.R. Manti says, hey, there's a causal use of ACE that means because of. And in the Journal of Biblical Literature, I've got the articles over here that I discuss them in my paper. He basically said, oh, well, this word ACE in the extra biblical Greek can mean because of. And um, Ralph Marcus went through and dismantled every one of his arguments. And most of the ones like Daniel B. Wallace this is what Daniel B. Wallace said in the discussion uh, of the 50s between Marcus and Manti. Uh, Wallace, Daniel Wallace, said this Marcus ably demonstrated the linguistic evidence for a causal use of ACE fell short of proof. So I would say this um, I think that I think that what's happening here is you're starting with your theology of baptism can't be for the remission of sins. And from there, you're going and trying to find this causal use when the way you should study is to say, Okay, what does this Greek preposition mean? 1774 times, uh, it, it means it's directional, it's pointing forwards. So whenever you go to Acts 2.38 and say, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, what that leads you to say is, well, they're saved before, so you don't even have to repent. I mean, Jesus in Luke 13.3 and 5 said, unless you repent, you will all perish. Acts 17.30, Paul said, times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So the idea that someone is saved at the point of belief and they don't even really have to repent, I would say that flies in the face of all kinds of New Testament passages. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, I just don't think that, that that's something to base your salvation off is that this word used 1700 times, mm -hmm. maybe five or six times has a causal use that, the only Greek grammar I'm aware of it even being in is the one that the guy wrote it, J.R. Manti, uh, it's in. So anyway, I'm on, that's that's my, I, I look at BDAG. BDAG says, what does uh, ACE mean? Marker of goals involving effective abstract sus, uh, sus, uh, suitability into the per, denoting the purpose in order to, and it gives Acts 2.38. Um, it also quotes Matthew 26, 28, that says, this is the blood of my covenant, which is shed for ace, a feast and harmartion for the men, the, for many, for the remission of sins. So in Matthew 26, 28, was Jesus Christ, did he shed his blood because mm. sin? Thank you for asking that. I've been waiting no. on that. You know, there's a lot of, wait, wait, can I answer that? It sounded like a question. It's not a question. 
Jesus oh. shed his blood in Matthew 26, 28. Jesus shed his blood for the remission of sins. In Acts 2, 38, Peter says, repent and be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. So the phrases are identical except for the word ton. It's like an article. So, man, I mean, I don't know how you get that unless you just say, well, the Greek's identical, but I'm okay with what it means in Matthew 26, 28. But in Acts 2, 38, they, they have to be saved already. So it can't mean in order to, it has to mean because of, you know, anyway, you good. I, you want, I've got, yeah. I mean, I've got, once again, I've not to beat a dead horse. You love this but, one, don't you? You love Acts 2, 38, don't you? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a great verse. I it's mean, great I, got, one. I love it. I, I mean, I, I like it. This is Ralph Marcus. The Holy Spirit would have used dia. It's the Greek preposition dia in the accusative case. If he wanted to say, uh, because of Baptist Greek scholar, J.W. Wilmarth, listen to this one. Is a Baptist scholar, a Greek scholar, not a member of the Church of Christ. We agree with the Greek authorities, Hackett, Weiner, Meyer, that when the Campbellites translate ace in order to, in Acts 2.38, they translate it correctly. Charles B. Williams, he's a Baptist scholar who studied under A.T. Robertson, translated that you may have your sins forgiven. Henry Thayer, to obtain forgiveness. BDAG, Art Gingrich, so that your sins may be forgiven. I mean, this is so much that the NIV translators in 1973 released the NIV, and in Acts 2.38, they had, repent and be baptized so that your sins may be forgiven. But they got so many letters from people not liking it that in 84, they changed it back to for the forgiveness of sins. And Dr. Ken Barker, I think his name, was on the translation committee. He was also on the NASB. And he wrote, I believe we translated it first, uh, correctly the first time. So all I'm saying is Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized in order to obtain the remission of your sins. I'm just saying don't think that it's only members of the churches of Christ that think that's what the Greek says. There's scholars from all over the world, guys who care more about Greek than what the Greek says, than the theology. And I just think that that's, it's clear. That's what that passage is saying. You can keep going. If you want, I'm good for now. Yeah. I think, I think it's good. So yeah, I do believe it's uh, it can be used because of in reference to, um, something, you know, uh, so yeah. Um, let me see here. Right here. Okay. So here's just an example. And it's a good verse. But we'll look at some other things too. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, right? Uh, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Concerning the Greek, it has the word ice there. Okay, you see right here in the Greek, actual Greek. Where are you, in? Where are you at? This is Romans oh. 4, 20. Uh, Romans no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. In the Greek, the actual Greek, there's the word ice. So it means... In reference to, no, nothing made him waver concerning the promises of God, something that happened in the past. See, he, he had this belief, no unbelief in the future. Once he had that belief, no unbelief in the future made him waver, what, ice, concerning, in reference to the promises of God, which were in the past. So to say that it's never, I can give you some more, but. Well, well I'm we, happy to talk about that one before you just, you know. No, I'm just, so, I'm, you just said never. I'm just giving you one. But look, let me, let me explain something here. <laughs> That's not what that passage means. That's actually funny enough. That's one of the passages that J.R. Manthe tried to use that Ralph Marcus dismantled. So I know that there are passages you can go to and say, well, this is a use of ace as because and, and not let anybody explain it. In reference but, to? So, okay. So you want me to explain it or do sure. you want me not to? No, go ahead. So, try to explain it. so fully convinced not that God was able to, uh, he had promises. So no unbelief made him waver concerning ice in reference to the promises of God. So this word. Um, you want me to explain it or are you going to explain it? I know you're not going to explain it the way I think it ought to be explained. Depending on your translation, he did not waver ace. That's the Greek word. So what mm -hmm. should it be translated? The Greek word at. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. So this is a passage that Manti asserted that that ought to be translated, but because of the promise of God, he didn't waver. But the thing is, no, there's nothing really that fits that interpretation. The passage is not saying that the reason Abraham didn't waver in unbelief 
to the promise of God. Paul said that Abraham was looking toward the fulfillment of God's promise. You can't read it and say, well, this is what I think it means in English. You have to say, what does the Greek say? So the fulfillment of the promise being talked about was in the future. So Abraham looked forward. He looked at it. So Aladdin, that was that was what was the catalyst for it. So With no unbelief and the promise that he received from God. He received that promise in the past, right? So if I'm happy to have a discuss, if you want to pick out which causal uses that you want, what you think it's used as because of, if you Google it, you can find an article that says, mm-hmm. well, the word ace means because of, and here's five passages. No, it and can I'm, be. It can be. No, I'm saying, I'm well, saying, no, just because, I mean, of course you say no. I got I'm saying just because somebody in an article on the internet says it can be like John MacArthur. What does a man? I didn't get that from MacArthur? the internet, but go ahead. Like, go ahead. John just, MacArthur got it from an internet from a kid in the eighth, you know, probably in eighth grade, living in under his basement of his mom's house. Said that. So John MacArthur's saying that. Check no, this out. What, I, what I'm saying is that there are lots of guys who make bad arguments from English to support their theological bias. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying you don't make the argument from English. You look at what the word means in Greek according to a lexicon, and you go from there. And we've me and you have talked about BDAG's a great one. And when you go to Acts 238 and you look up what does ace mean. It does not say because of. So I'm saying that that argument is not being made from Greek. It's not saying, what does the text actually say? It's This is people looking at it and saying, well, I don't believe baptism is necessary for salvation. Therefore, it has to mean because of. And I just don't think that that's an honest way to interpret a text. Okay. So here, John's baptism. Yep. Right there. So a baptism of repentance for ace right the forgiveness of sins so were when they were baptized in john's baptism were their sins forgiven you want me to make your point for you or do you want to make it for yourself <laughs> you do what you want bob i'm asking I mean, you when I'd love, i want you to repentance for the forgiveness of sins did they receive the forgiveness of sins when they were baptized i'm just asking Yes, that's what the text says. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, again, this is why context matters, because it says in Revelation that there's four corners of the earth. That's what it says. Trey, Luke Luke 3.3, he went into the Jordan, all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That's Mm -hmm. ace. That's my point. That's the opposite of what you're trying to say. No, like, no. Yeah, you're ace. That's unto. John's remember, baptism. Remember, you were getting on me because I'm, I'm, you're, I'm as answering my own questions. Now you're answering your own questions. No, you, you brought up Luke three three. I didn't bring it up. Yeah, but I didn't say the point. You told me my point. I'll tell you my point. So right. check it out. So remember last week I asked you when were the people's sins forgiven in the Old Testament? What'd you say? When were the sins? Do you no, not I mean I want just you know, there's probably somebody watching this that didn't watch the first one. So I said so, two perspectives. I said from the perspective, all uh, sins that have ever been forgiven have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus that was shed at the cross. Romans 3, 23 through 26 talks about that. Now, from the perspective of the person, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, Peter said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. In Acts 2, 38, they were supposed to do what? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. So I understand your theology, and I don't think your theology lines up with what those passages say. So, but it depends on whose perspective. That's yeah. what I said. That's I what understand I said. that you don't think it lines up um, because I'm the Christian faith. I don't believe water can baptism I, saves. I believe that Jesus can Christ I, saves. Can I answer? Can I answer? I'll let you get yeah. going. Let me know I when just, I can answer. Okay. Thank you. I just want to make one little thing. Over the last probably five, six hours, you always drop these little things about the historical faith and what you believe is historical. It's actually not. If you go back and look at resources, the idea that John 3 is not talking about baptism or any of these passages, Zwingli, Huldrych Zwingli and Calvin, that was 1500 is the first time anybody said that. If you want proof of this, I don't have to do it for you. Go look up John chapter 3, uh, verse 5. John Calvin's own commentary. He admits, he says, all expositors before me, Chrysostom, which was his favorite expositor, he loved him more than Augustine. He said, all of the ones before me have said that this is referencing baptism, but he says it would be inappropriate. If you go read, these guys are not inspired, but the early church writers, all of those guys for the first couple hundred years, all taught baptism was for the remission of sins. So, you know, you're going to disagree and I'm going to disagree, but 
when you say the historical Christian faith, that's 500 years ago, man. That's 1,500 years too short. If you go back to 110 to 165, when Justin Martyr lived, Justin Martyr talked about they were regenerated in the water, baptized for their mission of sins. And he even quotes John 3, 3 through 5. Um, I could go through. I'm not going to. If anyone wants the resources, email me or find me on Facebook, Gallagher at GBNTV.org. I will give you pages and pages of early church fathers who are not inspired, but they all thought baptism was for the remission of sins, and that's when you contact the blood of Christ. So just, you know, every once in a while you'll say the historical faith. And I'm like, that's the